Hello everyone. Uh, today we begin our spring semester and uh, our study of the Middle Ages. Well, the Middle Ages, the name itself, is um, characteristic and uh, it essentially designates uh, the time period between uh, the end of the classical era and the beginning of the modern era that began during the Renaissance. And in fact, during the Renaissance, the Renaissance scholars considered that the years preceding their time, they were not just middle years, but they in fact were zero years, that nothing happened. They felt that interest in humanity that very much characterized the classical era and then will begin to characterize the modern era as well was completely absent and as such not interesting and uh, not worthy of consideration. Well, with uh, further scholarship, it turned out not quite true. In fact, the era is fascinating. It is true that um, revelation uh, superseded uh, reason during the time just as religion a religion, monotheistic religion, superseded uh, polytheism. And uh, the times medieval uh, were essentially times um, religious, uh, whether it's uh, Christianity or later Islam. But even Christianity was not, uh, was not consistent because uh, Western Christianity will come to differ considerably from Eastern Christianity. And we will in fact begin with the, um, with the culture of the Eastern Roman Empire. Because what will happen throughout the 5th century and towards the end of the 5th century is the um, disintegration of the Western Roman Empire. Beginning already in the 4th century a number of Germanic tribes, Germanic tribes, um, Eastern tribes such as Huns, uh, would uh, push west, push south, and ultimately destroy the um, Western Roman Empire, as you see it here. Uh, this is just an example. These are the hordes of the of Huns who were brilliant. Uh, riders and uh, could shoot multiple uh, arrows from the backs of their ponies. Uh, but in addition to Huns, also the Germanic tribes such as uh, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, etc., etc., a number of them pushed down and uh, the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, came to an end. Here again is uh, still another slide that addresses the same phenomenon. However, as you see, the East remained unaffected. And this is what the Roman Empire consisted of, the lands of the uh, Roman Empire at its height. Uh, towards the end, uh, already in the 4th century, the beginning of the 4th century, it was considered too large to get to govern and it was split into two parts, the eastern part of the empire and the western part of the empire. And as we had just seen, while the western part of the empire was attacked and then ultimately split into a number of ethnic kingdoms, the eastern part of the empire remained intact for a while. And there the Roman civilization continued. It continued under a very different guise um, because the religion now was not polytheistic, it was monotheistic. And um, the language ultimately will not be Latin, it will be Greek. But um, many of the ostensible forms of uh, the Roman Empire will prevail and uh, the culture as such will continue under this new guise. So while the West will indeed sink at some places to the level of 
practically subhuman existence. Uh, the East, however, will continue to prosper. It will come to be known as the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantines themselves always called themselves Romans. And the Byzantine emperors always called themselves Roman emperors because, well, as such, they uh, ultimately were. Uh, the name Byzantine comes from a little town of Byzantium that was uh, a Greek town and that was later uh, renamed Constantinople. And here we have it. Uh, the, uh, we will be looking now at the, it is called the Oriental Empire. And here it is, the Occidental Empire, which is in yellow, and the Oriental Empire, which is in pink, right here. And uh, we are using Occidental and Oriental here as Latin terms for West and East, also art historical and historical terms as they were used during the Middle Ages and later used in scholarship. Thus the Byzantine Empire that um, will exist for another thousand years. The uh, Western Roman Empire existed for a thousand years. Then it came to the, to an, to the end at the end of the um, 5th century, but the Byzantine Empire that was founded by the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century will in fact exist until Constantinople was um, taken by the Ottoman Turks in the year 1453, more than a thousand years later. Here it is. It is um, divided into uh, into several periods, four periods to say, uh, to be exact. The early Byzantine period from the uh, middle of the fourth century when it was founded by the Emperor Constantine. Then the middle Byzantine period uh, that uh, began after the iconoclastic controversy that started in the middle of the eighth century and will continue for a hundred years and will change the um, attitudes of the empire. The Middle Byzantine Empire is um, from the middle of the 9th century to about the year 1200. Then there will be a period of Latin occupation that will last for about 55 years and that's called the Latin occupation period. And finally the last period of Byzantium from the middle of the 13th century until uh, its um, conquest by the Ottoman Turks in the middle of the 15th century. Here goes. Emperor Constantine, uh, who lived uh, in, the, um, in the 4th century, the early 4th century, was the one who decided to transfer the capital of uh, the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople. He is here, his um, tremendous uh, head, which is about eight and a half feet, is in the Capitol Museums in Rome. He also is the one who will be the first emperor, Roman emperor, to accept Christianity on his deathbed. Uh, these are all parts of a huge statue of the emperor, uh, right here, the statue was a seated statue of Constantine of uh, tremendous size and you can gauge the size by uh, this painting of uh, still another imperial head that's being carved. And right here you can see the relative size of a human body to a carved uh, head of uh, a similar statue. This statue set inside a Roman basilica. A Roman basilica was a civic building. Uh, later Christians will adopt it for their religious purposes and thus today we associate the word basilica with uh, an ecclesiastical building but it wasn't so during the Roman time. It was in fact a civic building, a building where Often ju jurisprudence uh, was conducted, but then otherwise it could be a shopping mall. 
Uh, here are just the imaginative example of what these basilicas may have looked like. They were spectacular architectural buildings and uh, most ancient civilizations loved color, so as a result their buildings were very, very colorful. Here's one example and here's my, uh, my favorite pet peeve. Uh, the original Penn Station in New York that only existed for 50 years was in fact based, its architecture was based on a Roman basilica. And here you see the inside of the Penn Station and that is in fact the inside of a Roman basilica. And it is my pet peeve because it only existed for 50 years and uh, was destroyed in 1963 in favor of, uh, well, the modern building that we have today, which uh, is incomparable uh, to what it replaced. And uh, here is the uh, Basilica of uh, uh, Constantine, uh, Constantine and Maxentius, and this is what's, what remains of it today in the Roman Forum, right here. This is the Roman Forum as we see it today, and there you can see the ruins of the basilica. It was a very, very large basilica. There's the Colosseum uh, that you see in the background and the remains of uh, the Roman Forum. Here is another view and you see the ceiling right there. It's called the Coffered Ceiling. The basilica was called the Basilica of Constantine and Maxentius. Reason being that they were co-emperors, but in the very early 4th century, Constantine defeated Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge in the name of Christ. His mother, Helena, was Christian, and uh, ever since then, he uh, was very tolerant of Christianity, because Christianity before that time was not uh, one of the official religious of, uh, religions of Rome. In fact, it was largely prohibited, even though Romans being um, extremely open-minded when it came to religious beliefs and very tolerant of uh, different faiths, uh, did not exercise uh, a strict control over prohibition of Christianity. Once in a while there were persecutions but they were not uh, as frequent as uh, history will have us believe, as uh, Christian writers will have us believe. Um, but already by the early 4th century, empire was not well, and uh, uh, there was a great deal of economic strife, um, the devaluation of the coin, illness, diseases, devastated the empire, reduced the population, and uh, Christianity was unstoppable at this point. Uh, perhaps Constantine decided to transfer the capital closer to uh, the birth of uh, the Christian religion, closer to the East. And uh, also the Romans considered the city of Troy right there Carry corner from Constantinople as their origin. The Romans uh, considered their founder Aeneas having come from the east, from the city of Troy. Uh, Aeneas who was uh, the son of the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess Venus, and uh, was uh, the only surviving hero after the fall of Troy, and uh, the Romans very much considered that, that he ultimately traveled uh, west from Troy, and his uh, descendants, Romulus and Remus, then founded Rome. So it would be logical for a Roman emperor to wish to go back to the lands of, uh, of origin. And uh, as such, he transferred Rome almost on the same meridian to Constantinople, and thus was birthed the Byzantine Empire as we know it, or the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, the, the city of Constantinople itself is located right here. It says here Byzance because it used to be called Byzantium, right there, between the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea along the Bosphorus. Right here. Bosphorus is right there. This is the Hellespont or the Dardanelles. And uh, the situation of the city was 
spectacular strategically because it connected, it literally connected East and West. And it became extremely prosperous, ultimately. The Roman Emperor, uh, by the name of Theodosius, who ruled at the very end of the 4th century, will establish Christianity as the only legal religion. With Constantine, he, um, he gave Christianity a legal status. He made it an official religion, but uh, other religions were also tolerated, as they had always been tolerated in the Roman Empire. However, with Theodosius, Christianity became the only acceptable religion of the empire, and as a result, all other religions, as well as schismatic sects of Christianity, were now persecuted. Um, he issued degrees that uh, effectively made Orthodox Nicene Christianity. The, re the reason it's called Nicene Christianity was because under Constantine, in the city of Nicene, the first ecumenical council uh, was uh, brought together, and that is the council that determined the Orthodox uh, principles of the new religion. And he made it official. He also, uh, he neither prevented nor punished the destruction of prominent Hellenistic temples of classical antiquity, and many were indeed destroyed, including the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, and also the Serapium in Alexandria, and both of them were very prominent uh, religious and intellectual centers of, uh, of the classical world. He dissolved the order of the Vestal Virgins in Rome, and in 393 he banned the pagan rituals of the Olympics in um, ancient Greece, not to be revived again until, as you see, 1896 until the year 1900, almost. Uh, the city grew tremendously, uh, became extremely wealthy, became a very remarkable city. But for the longest time, the, uh, the games, for instance, the games of the Hippodrome, which are the races, were, went on and, uh, in fact, uh, city politics very much, uh, very much centered on the teams, the blue and the green teams, uh, around the teams of the Hippodrome, and they were even called the Hippodrome politics, right there. Uh, here is a map. Uh, there are a number of walls uh, to, to keep the city safe, and uh, right here are the uh, old Constantine walls and then Theodosian walls, right here. Uh, they were legendary, these walls, and uh, their construction was uh, remarkable, really tremendous. There were triple walls, not to mention the moat. Uh, here they are. So all of this afforded Constantinople extraordinary protection. Probably one of the uh, greatest emperors uh, of the Eastern Empire was one Justinian and his wife, Theodora. In fact, the emperor himself was ruled, probably, by his wife. Um, his rule falls on the um, 6th century AD. Everything now is AD. And um, his dynasty was uh, founded by his uncle, who was uh, a simple soldier. Who, uh, who went through, who came up through the ranks. He was illiterate, and the empire fell into his lap rather unexpectedly. He consequently adopted Justinian as his son, and Justinian followed him as emperor. Uh, he was succeeded in his nephew Justinian, by this time an adopted son, in 527, but uh, he already exercised considerable control. He ultimately was one of the most important figures of late antiquity. At this time, it is uh, early Middle Ages uh, in, um, in the West, 
and uh, he probably was the last emperor to speak Latin because after him it was only Greek because these were the eastern provinces, formerly Greek provinces. And uh, we have this image of Justinian, uh, we will look at the image closer in this lecture. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not a, a portrait of Justinian, this is a royal image and a semi-divine image of the emperor, the idea of the empire more than a portrait of the man. By this time, by the 6th century, as I had said, uh, the uh, Germanic tribes, the Germanic uh, people had conquered uh, all of the Western Empire and uh, the Ostrogoths conquered Italy and became kings of Italy while the Vandals had a, their own kingdom in the north of, um, of Africa. And uh, Justinian was extremely keen to reconquer the former Roman Empire in the West because uh, they still considered uh, themselves uh, the Eastern emperors, very much the Roman emperors, but realized that they were Roman emperors in name only, not in fact, because Rome now was uh, ruled uh, by Italy itself, was ruled now by um, a Germanic king. So, as a result, uh, Justinian sent uh, his brilliant general by the name of Belisarius to reconquer the lands, which Belisarius did at the expense of a uh, great amount of blood and suffering. He reconquered Italy and he conquered the Vandals. These conquests did not last long, but uh, such as they were, they certainly put the end of any kind of civilization, certainly in Italy, because with these conquests, all the aqueducts, for instance, were entirely destroyed, uh, and Italy ceased to know what uh, even elementary hygiene was. But once Belisarius did conquer uh, the lands, this is what uh, the empire under Justinian came to look like. Um, it just so happened, however, that as Justinian lay dying, a man was born by the name of Muhammad. And uh, within a century of Muhammad's own life, all these provinces will then be conquered by Islam. Meanwhile, as the lands were conquered, Justinian established um, well, an embassy, shall we say. It was called Exarchy, but it was an embassy, but not in Rome, but in Ravenna, uh, which sort of made sense because Rome, you see, was on the western side of the peninsula, Ravenna on the eastern side, and from Constantinople it was easier to come here than go around to Rome, so uh, an Exarchy was established in Ravenna. And it so happened that um, it is, in fact, in Italy, it is in Ravenna, around Ravenna, that the most brilliant artistic remains survived uh, from the first Byzantine period. The first Byzantine period, as I had mentioned before, began with the foundation of uh, Constantinople in the, uh, approximately, in the middle of the 4th century, till the middle of the uh, 8th century, when uh, there will be the so-called iconoclastic controversy, of which we will um, talk presently. But as a result of this controversy, a great number of uh, art objects and icons were destroyed in Constantinople itself. And then later on, a Western Crusade will go through Constantinople and ultimately it was conquered by Islam. So a lot of artistic heritage from the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople itself will be destroyed. And as a result, we are very lucky to have the remains of this heritage elsewhere. And the city of Ravenna, as um, the city of... Um, 
the embassy of Constantinople in Italy has uh, wonderful examples. And here's the city of Ravenna, as I said. Uh, Belisarius, perhaps this is the portrait of Belisarius again. Uh, perhaps not the, uh, the actual portrait, but the image of Belisarius, the very determined image. And here was, he was the, uh, the general of Justinians who conquered these lands. It is done in um, the technique called mosaic, tessera mosaic. Tessera are tiny, tiny little pieces of glass that are colored from the back, put together to make a picture. Uh, mosaic uh, most probably originated in, uh, in Greece and, uh, and uh, with pebbles originally, sort of like uh, our kitchen tiles, uh, which is essentially the same technique, except the tessera are very, very tiny. And as such, they can compose uh, uh, a likeness or an image and, in fact, can even depict light and shadow. The uh, Belisarius, uh, if one wants to know more about the events surrounding the conquest of uh, the Western Empire by Belisarius, here's a brilliant book called Count Belisarius uh, by um, Robert Graves. And uh, here is depicted Belisarius with his wife, Antonina. And it, uh, the book paints a very vivid picture, not only his conquests, but also life in Constantinople, the contemporaneous life in Constantinople. As I said, these conquests ultimately came to naught. But uh, another enterprise of Justinian, and that is the compilation of uh, the Roman Codex of laws that survived and in fact proved of inestimable importance because uh, the later Napoleonic Code was based on it and uh, even the common law of the jurists of England uh, uh, that came up with the, the device, the common law nevertheless were also very aware of the uh, Roman law and even the ecclesiastical law had a Roman law as, uh, as its base. Well, to Ravenna, now we go. Here it is. And in Ravenna, at the time of Justinian, now Justinian never came to Ravenna. Belisarius did, he came to Italy. But Justinian uh, never came to Italy. In Ravenna, there is um, a beautiful little church, which is called San Vitale. Uh, dedicated to a saint by the name of uh, uh, Vitalis. The church is an octagon done in red brick and uh, from the outside uh, doesn't appear to be uh, anything spectacular until one walks into the church. This church is also a wonderful example, a very early example of the so-called flying buttresses with which we will meet on many occasions uh, in our study, particularly in uh, Gothic cathedrals. A buttress is uh, masonry that uh, supports the wall, and a buttress usually uh, uh, projects from the wall, makes the wall thicker so that it would be more stable. A flying buttress is the buttress that, as you see it here, does not project from the wall directly, but actually performs the role of supporting the wall, flying over an empty space. And that's what you see here in, uh, in Ravenna. Uh, here it is, you can see that it's an octagon, and it is part of um, a large area today that also contains um, the archaeological museum of Ravenna. It also contains an earlier church uh, that we will look at as well. Uh, here it is, and uh, this is the plan, the narthex or the vestibule, essentially, is built uh, at an odd angle right here, but in fact there are doors in all the seven uh, sides of the, uh, of the building, but the main door is through the narthex. And as one walks through the narthex right here, uh, one then sees the uh, choir, and it is to the choir that we go now. 
uh, as one walks in, this is what we see. The architecture is very much based on ancient Roman architecture because, uh, well, Christians, when uh, Christianity was uh, ultimately legalized by um, Constantine, well, it didn't have architecture, it didn't have art, it had no artistic tradition. It was a relatively new religion. And uh, now that it was an organized religion and it required religious buildings, it uh, naturally looked back at uh, examples of Roman architecture. And, um, and as such, these buildings were built. And uh, here we have uh, a lovely central plan with beautiful uh, niches right here. And everything, everything was covered by mosaics. It's difficult to convey the impression today. Here is sort of a recreation of what uh, an early Byzantine church may have looked like, but and all of this would be done either in fresco or in mosaics. Here it is in mosaics, but as you see, alas, uh, many of them did not survive. However, much survived in the choir itself. So as we look at the choir, what we see, first of all, is the um, obsidial mosaics and the obsidial mosaics that are in the apse right here and it is a semi-dome above the apse that is called uh, the obsidial semi-dome view toward the altar and in this semi-dome what we see is the image of Christ surrounded by angels and saints. San Vitali himself is right here to the right of Christ. And here we see there's San Vitali. Beardless Christ here is beardless, as he often will be, particularly in the West, whereas in the East, Christ will often be depicted with a beard as an immutable part of the Trinity, God the Father, the Holy Ghost. So Christ and God the Father will be equated. Uh, beardless Christ here uh, is seated on uh, the blue globe and uh, and holding a scroll right here. The scroll is closed with these seven seals of the Apocalypse and he is flanked by the angels and uh, on one side is Bishop Ecclesius as it, is says, as it says here and on the other side is uh, San Vitalis right here. The difference in artistic attitudes uh, between uh, classical Rome and Byzantium will be uh, very remarkable because divine revelation is now valued far above human reason. As a result, interest in naturalistic human form has disappeared, in fact, and uh, what is valued is a vision of, uh, of heaven as uh, it might be. And as a result, heaven is presented in uh, gold tessera, in gold mosaics, and the figural imagery is no longer realistic. It is two-dimensional, as you see here. Even the folds, the way that we see the folds on the garments, they are conveyed through just dark lines, not light and dark as it is, not through uh, shade as it is in, uh, in reality. And uh, there's also a hieratic approach to painting, and that is those who are most important, of course, are the largest. And as you can imagine, Christ, while seated, is the same size as people, as figures around him. As a result, if he were to stand on his two feet, he would be uh, much, much larger. We see him as offering a crown to Saint Vitalis. Here he is, here is Christ, and you can see that uh, his eyes are very large. Uh, the whole thing is, uh, the whole image is abstracted now into a vision ra rather than naturalistic representation. Here is the crown, 
and um, his gaze is directed nowhere. There is no human communication there. There is only, as I said, divine apparition. But it's also possible that he is offering this crown to the Emperor Justinian, who appears on this mosaic. In fact, there are two mosaics, very important here. On the one side, on the right side of Christ, is the mosaic of Justinian with his court, and across from Justinian is the mosaic of the Empress Theodora with her court, right here, as you see. So as Christ offers his crown, he may be offering it to St. Vitalis, but he also may be offering it to Justinian, even now Justinian has his own crown in this image, right here. The mosaic is done as depicting Justinian in a, in a, in a liturgical, ecclesiastical procession towards the altar, because the altar is right there. And as such, Justinian is a high priest. And uh, the Byzantine emperors inherited this role from the Roman emperors because the Roman emperors were civic, uh, civil administrators, but they were also uh, high priests. They were heads of uh, the Roman religion. And as a result, uh, when uh, an emperor uh, moved from Rome to Constantinople, he, he kept the ecclesi his ecclesiastical role as well as his civil role. Interestingly, uh, later on when, uh, when Russia will accept Byzantine Christianity, ultimately uh, a Russian uh, emperor, a Russian czar, will also be head of the church. Justinian is flanked on both sides by his court. On his left, our right, are ecclesiastical figures, and on Justinian's right, our left are administrative and military figures. And uh, here's the figure right there next to Justinian that is considered to be Belisarius, uh, his, uh, his great general, who also was a consul uh, of the um, Byzantine Empire. Uh, Maximianus right here, uh, the name is there, and very often, in fact, in Eastern Church, uh, the uh, mosaicists provided names, which makes it much easier for us to know who is who. And Maximianus uh, was uh, a bishop of Ravenna, and uh, and here he is. Uh, the uh, ecclesiastic figures, including Maximianus, are holding the Bible, the cross, and Justinian himself is holding the uh, sacred vessel. And then to the right of him, as I said, administrators and the military procession. Interestingly, as you, um, if you look at their feet, uh, the more important person overlaps the less important person. And as such here, Justinian overlaps. His foot overlaps the foot of uh, Belisarius. And then uh, Maximianus himself, his foot overlaps uh, the foot of the ecclesiastic next to him. And same goes for the army, whoever, whosever feet overlap others. Uh, they do not necessarily correspond to the level of uh, people's heads. As you see, the feet are at different uh, levels while the heads are all uh, at the same level. This is called the isocephalic principle, the principle of isocephaly uh, that was developed in ancient Greece and uh, where all the heads are on the same level no matter where the feet are in a group of people. To make it more realistic, as it was the case with the Greeks, whereas the Byzantine artists did not really care about realism, as I said, they cared about apparition. And as such, you see this is a very two-dimensional, very flat representation, but glorious, glorious, remarkable, with the gold background. Uh, Justinian is uh, dressed in imperial purple. His administrators, right here, uh, Belisarius included, 
are dressed in uh, what looks like an offshoot of the Roman toga, but also with the purple stripes right here. And Justinian wears not only a crown, but also a halo. Because in the Eastern tradition, uh, uh, very often a ruler is in fact considered uh, semi-divine. That was the case uh, in Egypt, that was the case in Syria, case in Mesopotamia. And uh, even though we are now in the Christian era, uh, the uh, influences from nearby lands are very, very strong. And uh, so long as they uphold the image of the emperor, all the better. So Justinian here, as you see, wears um, a crown and has a halo behind him. Uh, an interesting symbol is right here on the shield. And we'll see this symbol in uh, Byzantine art quite often. This symbol is called uh, Cairo Yota, after the first three Greek letters of the name of Christ, Christos. Kai, which is Ha, right here, and here we see it as our X, and then Ro, which is Latin R, but looks like uh, our P, and it's right here. And then uh, the letter I for us, or Greek iota, that constitutes the deck of the rho. And they are these uh, three letters, the chi, which is h, and uh, rho, which is r, and I, Christos. Christos in Greek is Christ, and as a result, the chi rho iota designates that image. And here it is, we see it on the shield. This, this, this procession is ecclesiastical and as such dedicated to Christ. And here is Kai, there's a very small little Rho, and the Yota as the back of, uh, of Rho. Uh, across from the uh, mosaic of Justinian is the mosaic of uh, his wife Theodora. And here she is in the same procession with, uh, but even isocephaly is not quite, quite maintained here. She looks uh, somewhat taller than uh, her attendants, but that's perhaps of the crown. And, but she too, as you see, has a halo behind. Now in Byzantine tradition, women uh, were relegated to a gallery. And uh, this is what's happening here, even though Theodora is holding a sacred vessel in her own hands. However, two men who probably are eunuchs, and eunuchs were uh, a very common feature of a Byzantine court, uh, they are opening up the door for her and her ladies to go to the galleries. And it's very possible that one of the ladies right next to Theodora is Antonina, who was uh, her childhood friend and also became the wife of uh, the Belisarius. She too is wearing purple and the two men to her right, our left, wear a garment with the same purple straps as the ones next to Justinian. Uh, they are extremely important, these mosaics, because as I said, very, very little art from the first Byzantine period survived. Uh, from the east, from Constantinople, as a result of uh, the conquest of Constantinople on several occasions, and finally its conquest by Islam, that um, all these conquests did nothing, of course, for the longevity of, uh, of the city's art, unfortunately. So as a result, uh, having all this, these things in Ravenna uh, is, um, is remarkable. Uh, here they are. Uh, again, as I had mentioned before, uh, we should not really take these as portraits. These are more images of, uh, of the office of the empire, of uh, the office of emperor and uh, his wife. Actually, he, uh, Justinian established Theodora as his co-regent, uh, which even Augustus didn't do with his remarkable wife, Livia, uh, back six centuries earlier. But Theodora was, in fact, officially Justinian's uh, co-region. Uh, here they both are. 
still, whether they're portraits or not, uh, it's, uh, it's astonishing just to have this. Uh, here is now the R at the altar on both of our sides, uh, these um, uh, Theodore and Justinian mosaics. And we proceed now with our backs to the altar. And as we look up, there are more mosaics. Uh, this entire church, as I said, was just covered with mosaics. And on our right is, uh, this form is called the lunette. Is the uh, lunette, it's a mosaic also of um, the Holy Trinity. Uh, right here are three angels who appeared to Abraham when uh, Abraham and uh, his wife uh, Sarah already in uh, their later years despaired of uh, having children. However, three um, men appeared uh, before their tent and uh, they were fed by Abraham and here he is, Sarah is standing uh, in the background and uh, these angels uh, promised that a son will be born to them and indeed Sarah became pregnant and Isaac, the son of Sarah and Abraham, was born and then the next scene, this is called uh, an, a narrative, uh, a narrative uh, image where several scenes are shown and as a result here is the scene of Abraham bringing food to the angels that the angels partaking and then uh, God uh, demanding of Abraham to sacrifice his only son and this is the scene here where Isaac is somewhat grown and Abraham takes him uh, to this the place of sacrifice and is in fact ready to follow God's instructions and uh, and sacrifice him uh, to give God human sacrifice when God sends an angel and uh, stops Abraham's hand and uh, uh, as such uh, Isaac is now saved and a lamb is sacrificed in his stead so this is the lunette, it's very much part of the liturgical procession because this is the, the beginning of uh, Judaism and the importance of, uh, of sacrifice, the importance of future Eucharist. And this was seen, in fact, by later Christianity as God, in fact, sacrificing his own son, Jesus for the sins of humanity. Uh, this too is done in uh, the two-dimensional uh, principle as we see while we're looking at the angels uh, frontally while the table in front of them, the tabletop, is shown as uh, the bird flies and thus the plates in front of them are also shown as the bird uh, flies. So a different, uh, a different perspective of, uh, of painting, which of course will be picked up later in the 20th century, again, by the likes of Picasso. And then above them uh, there is uh, the cross of crucifixion that's being held by the angel and the two very important prophets, Jeremiah here and Moses on the other side are depicted. And, and as, I, as I had said before, Eastern Christianity and its art were very obliging in giving us, uh, for the most part, the names of people that were depicted. Whereas in the West, uh, this wasn't the case, and in most cases, uh, we could only tell figures by their attributes, as we will see. For instance, Saint Peter, who was given the keys to heaven and earth, is usually depicted with the keys. So, you know, that's Saint Peter. Saint Lawrence, whose martyrdom was uh, being burnt. Uh, alive uh, is usually depicted with a griddle on this sort of thing, whereas um, whereas the Byzantines were charitable and in fact wrote the names down. Thank God. Uh, here is the uh, uh, the um, close up uh, Abraham with Isaac. Um, I mean, there is an attempt, as you see, at some three dimensionality, at some sort of perspective, but a very awkward attempt and all the garments, even though some shade is introduced, nevertheless look very two-dimensional. But you can see the attempts 
uh, only the hand of God is shown because according to the second commandment, uh, second commandment forbids any, any representation of God's creation by human hand. And uh, while both Eastern and Western Christianity got around it by claiming that the illiterate cannot possibly know the scriptures unless they have something to look at, and the images are not devotional images, rather explanatory images, uh, still representing God himself was, uh, was uh, too much of a task. And uh, as such, we only, as a result, we only see God's hands for the most part. Uh, but uh, the secular uh, representation allowed uh, uh, the representation of birds, allowed the representations of plants, also abstract representation, and much of it also was part of the late Roman Empire. And we see parts of it also in, in Ravenna. Here are various saints, various fathers of the church, and here too everything is written. Thaddeus here, Serbasius there, and uh, the uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, decorative mosaics.